All right, hello everybody. I'm Michael. Uh, welcome back to Colonia Cast, the place where you can get your turtle biology and adventure stories uh, fix. Uh, joining me today in the in the upper right corner is the one and only Jean Pierre Thompson, uh, a Jack Reptile Naturalist 302. In the the lower left hand corner over here, we've got the Georgia geneticist Ken Wang. Uh, everyone. Round of applause. And then up in the upper left here, and cer certainly not last, but certainly not least, we've got KSU's one and only Jason Wills. So uh, we're, I guess, back today, um, and we had some scheduling errors, but that's all good. So uh, this is going to be sort of a, just us today, uh, but that that's fine. Uh, we'll have a good lineup of guests. We've already got more than a month of guests lined up. Uh, so the goal here is to talk to as many interesting people that focusing on turtles, but about wildlife, biology, conservation, uh, and to get sort of insightful com uh, conversations from that, uh, which is kind of our, our, uh, our unified interest here. But um, today, I guess we're just going to talk about what we've been up to lately and uh, just kind of bring you along with that. So I don't know if anyone, I, I mean, I guess we could just... I'm I'm sitting here and the weather's looking kind of nice today. It's been pretty for the past month. It's been pretty uh, cold out here, and although compared to, you know, I'm getting like a blank stare from Jack right now because I don't think that's the same thing. You you've had really bad weather lately. How's the weather been for everyone? I'm curious. Like, like, how are we? For me, right now it's 21 degrees out. It was even colder before, and there's a couple feet of snow on the ground, and. uh I can, only reason I can get anywhere is I have a Jeep. So a lot of people that have two-wheel drive vehicles are stuck in their house right now. Yeah, the cold. The, it's been a very cold winter, and I don't like the cold. <laughs> Can't do anything. It's unpleasant. Cold's just not for me. It's kind of interesting, too. I wonder how that's going to affect the turtles, because you guys don't generally have that in Delaware. So that uh, could... It's... it's well... It used to be cold like this more consistently, like 10 to 15 years ago and before. Like we used to have winters that we used to consistently get snow in the winters. But the past decade, we've barely had any. Like there's been some winters where it's never even gotten below freezing. And uh, but the, the weather's like shifted. Like instead of it being really cold and then the wind shifting into spring into March, it's just been like 45, 50 degrees all the way until like the first week of May. So that's like eventually the turtles just come out because they can't room it any longer well uh like we witnessed a little bit of that last uh april like it was the end of april and it was still like 35 40 degrees it was way too cold and uh the snapper was out foraging in the stream and night had like no body weight and uh all the wood turtles were back out but yeah it's normally not not nearly this cold here well and that you last year was weird too because there's kind of a punctuated winter right so it would get cold and then warm and then it was doing that here and then you said in the northeast it was kind of doing the same thing so i wonder how that's gonna if if the snow you're getting now is gonna make it so that there's gonna be kind of a distinct i don't know really how it is up there but here it's pretty a, a distinct cutoff over the course of a week it, it warms up pretty significantly and then it kind of stays at that level but last year it fluctuated and i have a feeling that put a lot of pressure on the animal, like they can deal with the cool down probably better than they can yeah. with warming up and cooling down su super quickly like that. If, if it's, if, if the temperature is fluctuating really fast, it, it messes with the turtles a lot. Cause I, I mean, I've, I've been to a couple creeks around here, like on a 65, 70 degree day in like March and the night before was really cold or the, and it's just a constant fluctuation. The turtles will come out, then it gets really cold. and A lot of them are dead. Like, I found like six or seven dead cooters in one day. They, there's no apparent cause of death. They looked like they might have just died from the cold. So that happens here. Yeah, they come out and it just messes up the, their metabolism. And, and and you can't, I mean, it, it just, it's so, I mean, however, rumination is so physiologically demanding. You can't expect to induce it super quickly like that. Like that snapper we found, this thing in New Jersey was that thing had to be i mean it was a large animal but it was way underweight i mean you can noticeably tell 
But that thing was active at night in a creek in mid-April, but it was still pretty cold. So stuff like that, I mean, they just can't deal with it. A, a distinct cutoff season, you probably could adapt. And if you're saying where you're at it was like that 15, 20 years ago consistently, then they're probably still pretty used to it. That's that's just a generation of the turtles by you. So it's the same adults. Oh, yeah. There'll be a... Uh... There is, there's a, there's a, there's a really quick cut. It doesn't tend to really, there's not much of a transition in temperature anymore. Like, like there's not really a spring. It's just kind of like winter. It's very cold for a long time. And then it hits a point where the weather just breaks. And it's within a few days, it'll be like straight summer weather. It'll go to like 85 degrees within a, within a couple of days. Like that normally happens in the early May. Last year was crazy though. I, I, I swear to God. It was really cold. It was. It had to be like fifty degrees on the first day of June. Like the winter would would not go away. Like it wasn't a cold winter, but it lasted like six months. It was. It was. That was pretty bad. I just hope this winter ends quicker than the last one. And it's, yeah, well, you're not the only one getting snow right now, is what I I I hear. So Ken, you're getting snow too. We yeah, we actually had snow like a days ago. It was really. Like, APM just started snowing out of nowhere. That's, uh, I, I saw that on someone's Instagram page that it was snowing in Georgia. So I was just amazed by that. And you know, one of the reasons that UGA was one of my uh, school options was because of the weather. But after hearing that, it's a little bit nerve wracking. So. Uh, I mean, I could put up with it. it. You know, it's a different, I think it's a different thing than up in, uh, Boston or wherever, so I I think that there's still definitely less of it, but uh, it does make me a little bit worried. Um, I mean, I don't imagine that like the roads in Georgia, in, like a Georgia winter, like get too terrible because I mean, like that's really like the worst of it. You know, it's just like the roads get real bad. So I, I don't know what what are what have like the driving conditions been like down there, Ken? Well, when there's snow in Georgia, I would say the road conditions are worse than like Michigan. Because the problem is, yeah, the problem is we don't have the machinery like clean the snow. So pretty much yeah. everything is shut down when there's snow. <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah. And even Delaware gets snow so inconsistently. I don't think the state has, I don't think the state has really effective protocols in place. And this is, uh, so I'll tell you, let me describe to you what I saw yesterday. So I swear half of the snow plows that I see are not like state, are not set by the state or anything. I, I really do think a lot of them are just rednecks that have a snow plow and they just go out and do it because nobody's going to ask questions if they see a truck with a snow plow. I drove past a tractor yesterday, just driving down the middle of the road, a big like John Deere. It was plowing the road and the dude had, a, he dude, the dude had a, bottle of uh, fireball whiskey and was just taking shots while driving it. <laughs> and I was like, wow, that, yeah, that's, that's Delaware. Man, you couldn't get away with that. Anything near that in California, you get dragged off the road, something like that. We, I mean, you, you, this is weird for all of you guys, but you don't see roadkill here. I mean, it's very rare. If you do, it's like a dead deer and it's all, it's all, because they, they just, it doesn't really make its. I mean, a lot of stuff makes its way on the road. I still am trying to figure out why, because it's actually strange. You just never see it here in terms of like the cities and everything. And you have plenty of animals that are coming into contact. You don't want to expect to see more. So maybe they're really effective at cleaning up the corpses like not long after. Well, you know, killed. I don't actually think that's the case because I think that they're pretty inefficient in a lot of places here. But uh, I think I think the reason is that now you essentially have all the animals that are best adapted to living in close proximity to humans, and uh, they've the gene pool at this point is the one that has all the stuff that's required to survive in very limited habitat. So that's just my 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 theory there. I think other people have expressed that viewpoint, but it, it's. I mean, there's a certain level of we're still kind of selection is still acting there, uh, so you do see stuff occasionally. But seriously, the last thing I saw that was roadkill here was a possum, and it was about eight months ago. And I mean, you guys get on the roads out by all of you guys. You get stretches where you get lots of stuff. I mean, I, I've never seen a turtle. So. It's mostly deer, deer and foxes and 
you're they'll they'll just walk out in the road and just stand in front of your car as you're barreling towards them. They won't even move a lot of the time. Like they're they're a serious hazard. They'll be because deer are just everywhere on the East Coast. Like especially in the Northeast, they have no major predators anymore. They have it for hundreds of years since we wiped them out. They they just they're everywhere. Like you can in the state park near me. Like if I drive through there, I have to go slow because you never know. Like thirty deer will just come out of the woods any moment. And there's a field that you, you drive by, and it's always packed with. There'll be dozens of them, and, and it's it's very common to see uh, the dead ones hit on the side of the road. That are so mangled. I wonder how it even happened. I'm like, was someone flying down this road at like a hundred miles an hour? Because it's essentially just piles of viscera left. But yeah, oh, wow. I see a lot. The uh, oh, deer on like the Kent State campus, they're like so desensitized to people that like I've been like walking to class or like working, like you walk like 10 feet away from them and they just they like don't even like look at you because they just know that like no one's going to mess with them. So it's, you know, they, they definitely aren't like skittish in the slightest. It's it's like that at uh, the state, the Sloan State Park in Southern Delaware. They're, I mean, you can touch them. Like, they'll, they won't even move if you get close to them. If you make sudden movements, they'll get spooked, but they'll let you get close to touch them. Like, not that it's a great idea, but uh, you could. But, like, they, they won't even move. But once, like, spring hits, I see a lot of roadkill turtles. Like, once they come out to nest, they're constantly crossing the roads. I find, well, every species I find dead of snappers. Terrapins, I, or I find tons of them because uh, there's a, there's the major highway, which is uh, Route 1. It goes all the way. It goes along the coast of Delaware, and then it goes down into Maryland. But it cuts right through the small, like the small strips of land that separate the ocean and the bay. The terrapins live in the bay, and they come out on these uh, barrier islands and uh, to nest. So the, this huge uh, highway crosses it, and they have to cross four lanes of traffic to get to the, the sand, like the big dunes, which is actually suitable for nesting. So, like, but the, before they put up fences to block the terrapins from moving, uh, you could easily find dozens of them killed, like, in, from May to, like, July. They would be all over the road. But What kind of fences do you guys have put up? Are they, because that's, like, that's an active area of research is how, what kind of fencing material is most effective and, does it does it actually work in your experience? I mean, you'd think it. There's, kinda... there's, there's a, and this definitely they definitely work. So, I actually, I, 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 I uh, they do work. The you said they, they do work. Yeah, I interned with the Cape and Lopez State Park, and we were last time I was there, we were removing invasive Japanese pines, and uh, the botanist or whatever his name, this, this guy was. He had been working with the state parks for a while. And we were just talking about the terrapins, and he's like, "Oh yeah, I was the one that led the project to put up the fence along the side of the highway. It's about a foot and a half, two feet tall. It's these little wooden poles, and they have like that plastic, or that black tarp plastic. I don't know what it's called, but you see it on construction sites. They have that going along it, and it's about four or five miles of it. Like it's long, so they had to be, they had to use, they had to be efficient with their money because obviously the most effective barriers are concrete. Like there's another." About 45 minutes up the road on the shore of the Delaware Bay, there's uh, another site that is that has a huge population of terrapins, and it's a small road, and, and there's all these boulders that the terrapins would get caught in. So what they did was they created some tunnels that went under the road and had concrete blocking them from everywhere else, and it would funnel them right into those uh, turtle tunnels. I think they work because I see far, I've seen far less uh, dead ones now. Like last year, I don't know if I saw a single roadkill terrapin after they put up the fence. That's good. I know they're, they've been testing the, the efficacy of a lot of that. There's one guy in Canada that does like all, a bunch of research on that. And they did this, a similar thing where they put up, it's like tarp. It's, it's like pretty like rigid plastic tarp and they put it up. It's like two feet high. And it, I mean, they literally did it for miles on the, on there. It's pretty incredible, but the turtles are, yeah, just funneled into tunnels that go under the street. And they they make their way through there, which it seems like that's the most effective way to do it if they can't climb it. But in the past, they've done like little fence kind of things that they've just been able to climb up. And concrete, honestly, I mean, if they can scale it, sometimes it's a little bit easier. So that that fencing is seems like it's the best way to do it. But uh, by us, you don't really see that kind of thing. The pond turtles, actually, I've never seen it, but there is one spot where. 
So one of my friends sent me a video and, and said, I found this turtle crossing the road and it happened to be a pond turtle. Uh, so there is a spot where they come out here and they do actually cross the road, I get, I, I mean, they, they do, I just, it would be a rare thing to see, but it honestly could be something worth talking to the, the creek about because, well, right around now, they're probably not moving too much, but come March, they could be moving back into the water. So we could have a similar thing going on. But it would be interesting to compare sort of – we'd have to use a similar strategy to by you guys because you've got a lot more experience with that kind of thing. With the – Ken, do you, yeah. do you guys have a lot – and that's, that's actually pretty good on your legislation, your local legislation for getting that kind of thing done because a lot of people aren't that proactive with wildlife barriers. That tends to be low down on the, on the budget of what they do. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I've seen several approaches to it where it would be effective if they incorporated it into the infrastructure of just how they build roads in general. Like rather than trying to modify them afterwards, if they just built. Uh, I, I've seen some of these. There's there's many different ideas, but one of the most interesting ones was you know how like there's those concrete dividers on some major highways. They had like shorter ones, probably around a foot tall, that ran along most of the length of the road. And then they, they came to these tunnels that go under the road. And it's like a two foot by two foot tunnel. So most animals that are small can go through that. And uh, it's just got a metal grate on top. So cars can drive over it. But uh, it'll allow small animals to, to cross the roads without actually being in danger. Yeah, the grate idea is an, an interesting one. There's some railroad I forget where it is. It might actually be the Mojave, and they've put little grates so when the turtles cross, they get they fall into the grates, and they have to they have to follow them out of the railroad tracks, and the, the train will hit them. So that's kind of an interesting way to do it too. I mean, it, it they all that seems to be the way. It, it funneling the animal sort of as opposed to just blocking it because they can find a way, as we know, turtles can generally find a way to scale things pretty severely He's snapping turtles climbing chain link fences and all that kind of yeah. stuff they can get over although you know who does it most effectively is georgia who was it you jack that was telling me about the the walls in georgia i forgot someone someone said they're like 20 feet tall maybe it was someone at my school but I agree, because when you're driving like right outside of Atlanta, the the dividers uh, between the the freeway and the there, I mean those things are massive. It's like uh, the Great Wall of China between um, the the high. Have, there's a lot of that up here in the Northeast because it's so densely like populated here. Uh, you get like those 20 foot tall walls they have along the sides of the highway and it pretty much funnels the, the noise straight up. I just kind of odd like the sound will just resonate off of it and has nowhere else to go. It doesn't bounce off into the neighborhoods and all the people surrounding because the highways are loud. It's probably good Plus, for the animals, you know? The animals sometimes, are... sometimes the deer manages to get over and gets trapped in the highway, but. Yeah. But not that long. They hit a horse here in Delaware. Like a horse got loose, and someone like decked it in their truck. Like, jeez, <laughs> that's not something you want to hit. That's that's like hitting another car. Yeah, we had a hippo at one point in Orange County. The uh, the the only so we've got one natural lake in the entire county. Everything else is man-made, which. For some would be surprising for others that have been here you'd realize that that's not that that's not far off from believable uh but the one natural lake we have in it was like the early late 60s early 70s there was this zoo that took up a good portion of the county in the middle of the county and that natural lake happened to be like right at the outskirts of the property and some hippo got loose someone left the gate open or something and it made its way into the lake. And I forget what the story was, but they knew it was gone. But it took them like multiple weeks to find this thing. And finally, they tracked it down to this lake. that I, I've hiked by it before. I could see where a hippo could go unnoticed in there. And uh, eventually, they found it. And they had like a helicopter over it. And it was on the news. And they were like tracking this thing because they got it out of the water. 
And then someone came in and shot it with a tranquilizer and actually <laughs> sound like a terrible person, but it's just like, it's an insane story, but they actually killed it when they tranquilized it because they overdosed the tranquilizer <laughs> and they, it was on the news. So they, they're like on the news broadcasting this, I guess. And they shot it. They're like, yay, yay we, we fixed the problem. And then all of a sudden they come back and they're like, no, it's dead. And, and everyone's like heartbroken because this thing was like, so it's messed up, but it was kind of, I mean, it's just a crazy story. Could you You're imagine? Pretty hard, hard at that. I mean, yeah. Uh, I mean, if no one had noticed, we'd have a hippo just roaming around. It. His name was Bubbles. Bubbles I'm the hippo. In, and I see a hippo. I'm, 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 I'm crapping my pants and running in the other direction. <laughs> if, like, if you want to talk about the scariest animals that you could encounter in the wild that would make most stuff's not going to make me run if we're doing field stuff but a hippo that's if i'm getting chased by a hippo i'm finding the nearest tree and scaling that <laughs> like those things can run at like 35 miles an hour on the land and they'll they'll just chase you they don't care they're so they're so aggressive for like no reason they, i think they kill more people than any other terrestrial animal in the world that isn't like a domestic animal yeah, I'd rather I'd rather be faced with an, like a large elephant than have to flee from a hippo. I don't. I think that both of those scenarios are definitely desirable. <laughs> it's not a situation I want to find myself in where I'm running for my dear life from a hippo. I took a, like this uh, Ice Age Hunters course for like my anthropology like uh, major last semester. And, like one of the sections was on like the whole basically like debunking the hypothesis that like the Clovis people like hunted uh, like mammoths to extinction. So we like looked at like the biology of like mammoths and like kind of like a sort of the modern sort of studies um, like looking at um, like I guess it's experimental archaeology looking at like uh, taking like Clovis tools and trying like trying to butcher and like um see how their effectiveness on like modern like elephants and stuff and it's like the, the likelihood of you like taking down something that big is like one in a million so it's like if you're just I don't know, you find one on like some random turtle trip like that would wouldn't be a good day for anyone would it no that's an interesting topic right there is I think the humans had more of an impact on megafaunal mammals in like southern climates. I don't think it had as much of an impact on like the woolly mammoths like up in the north. But I mean, there there are sites of, uh, I mean, there was strong, there was larger populations of humans that had more sophisticated hunting techniques in like northern Mexico and the southwest and the southeast than there were in like Canada and everything. So, but, yeah, I mean, you know that that. Uh, the Hespero Testudo, uh, the, the the complete skeleton, I guess, that they've got. I don't know what museum that's in, but the one that's got the arrow through the shell. I mean, that's Actually, testament. That's testament to the fact that there were tools around that could do some damage back then. So, even there's then, a, if you look at the frequent, so like I think, well, like one of the things like with the mammoths and the sort of like larger like animals is. Like the uh, frequency of like the sites where, like, um, they found like uh, points or whatever like associated with like mammoths and some of those like larger megafauna is incredibly like small compared to like what they found what they found with like deer and a lot of like the I guess smaller megafauna. So it's like it, you you see like the sort of like one off things of being like oh they they found a point like embedded in like the uh, the bones or whatever, but it's like the likelihood that they're like having you know, success at the very least at like a larger scale is like um, not 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 super like i guess believable i guess it makes sense with like a large tortoise because that's you know like a fairly slow yeah, yeah. animal but it's, it's pretty interesting to have existed. 60 percent of all tortoises that have existed in the past fifteen thousand years are extinct now so over half of all tortoises that have existed alongside mankind are extinct and uh, most of the ones that are extinct were large too so without the influence of uh humans large it might actually have been more common to find larger tortoises than smaller ones and uh i mean for, they, they're probably the most vulnerable megafaunal animal at the time like there's not really much required as long as you can butcher them that's about it like not hard to find 
they're not hard to kill. They can't really defend themselves other than pulling into their shell or, and, uh, if you, if you literally, if you have a rock or something, you can you can chip at the shell long enough, you'll get through it. So those they were extremely vulnerable, but, and it's been correlated with. Uh, God, I have the, I have the article for it. It's like it was from 2015. It was an IUCN article. It was detailing all the extinct uh, colonians from the past, from the Pleistocene and even into the Pliocene. But uh, it goes back far. Like you trace back the. Like the, every population of humans, and this goes to other species of hominids that are older than us, not just humans, but like a Homo erectus and all these other uh, species. Whenever they moved to a new area, it was, it's it's at the same time uh, a, a loss of the tortoise diversity was seen. Like there was other uh, those other stigma kellys and centric kellys that no longer exist, and uh, some of those, those some of those are harder to tell because the fossils are like three million years old and it's just shell fragments. But uh, they are burned and scorched, so and have cut marks on them, indicating they were they were butchered. And uh, and in, in the New World, it's been Hesper testudo, and then the Caribbean tortoises, which were Kelanoidus, and then some more Kelanoidus in the in Central and South America. I think the only lo- the only large tortoise left in the Central and South America really is the yellowfoot, but they're not consistently giant and. They live in such a. They're so. They're. They actually are really difficult to detect in their habitat. It's a dense jungle, so it's not like a four hundred pound tortoise just wandering around. Uh, I don't know some pine lands in southern Florida. Like you, you'd see that a mile away. But yeah, I mean, I, it's definitely an interesting debate behind that. I think there's people that get behind both sides pretty uh, quickly, just kind of to ba- bolster whatever they think. I I, th- I don't think that a synergistic effect should really uh, of humans, but also climate and, and uh, associated ecosystem change. Uh, some some sort of effect of both of those things can be ruled out. So for the for the insular species, uh, I think that ob- humans obviously play a massive role in that, and that's detectable. I mean, you've got species like the the. Uh, the uh, masquerine tortoises that in in the course, you know, I think that it's an interesting debate. The, the certain species, it's it's definitely not really debatable. Uh, obviously, insular tortoises, where we've got recorded history, where they went from massive populations to essentially nothing, well, to nothing. Uh, it's it's easier to sort of pinpoint the cause there. But at the same rate, when you talk about mainland species. Hespero testudo, I guess Hespero testudo in the southeastern U.S. is the biggest one that sort of stands out to me as interesting because Florida back then was altered, but at the same rate, large tortoises, they'd be slower and it would be harder to get away from people, but, but people didn't really penetrate into a lot of sections. And I mean, we're talking 9,000 years ago, so this is not really even recent history where, you, where you'd have some level of colonization. But... And the ecosystem changed too, but to what extent? That's not been measured quite as much. I, I think that there's certainly an effect of both. And you have, like, like Bahamian tortoises and uh, I guess Antilles tortoises. They're sort of uh, that's an example where humans sort of dealt the final blow there. But when you have an insular species, it's a whole different deal than a species that is uh, confined to a larger area or, or distributed over a, lo- a larger area, and uh, I guess the other one too that's interesting is the the gopherus, the bolson tortoises that supposedly used to be uh, ten thousand years ago up in, in more northerly, actually into North America, Arizona, New Mexico, and that one, you know, I think a lot of people use it sort of as PR. It's easier to say that they went extinct because of humans, so we should put them back. I think at the same rate, if it was due to some sort of climate change and habitat change that you'd still have sort of a valid reason to try to reintroduce them. But just saying it's humans a lot of times goes without any sort of quantification. I think that it's, it's important that we actually analyze the question. Uh, but certainly humans can be tra- traced down to sort of causing issues with the tortoises. But did they really cause extinction of some of these mainland species that ranged over wide areas? I mean, it's hard to say. This was... The, the, the beginning of the Holocene and end of the Pleistocene was a pretty turbulent time uh, climatically, and so we can't really rule that that could have had an effect out in a large ectotherms 
it certainly would have a pretty profound, if it, even if temperature changed a little bit in that ecosystems. But it's certainly interesting. I mean, it, there's sort of different schools of thought behind this. I think. I, I think. Like, oh, 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 oh. I was going to say, I think uh, we have to take into account what, what's actually available in the fossil record. I think uh, part of why we know so much about Hespero Testudo and all of the sub southeastern tortoises is the fossil record is amazingly presented in Florida. And uh, Pleistocene fossils are, are everywhere. And, and like Pleistocene age fossils are everywhere in the southeast. And uh, But you go to other areas of the world where uh, the fossil record is way less complete. It's not as well known. And... Uh, it's harder to make conclusions. It's hard to make any conclusions when you're talking 10,000 years ago or more. But uh, there are certain things that you could look at, which you still have to take with a grain of salt. It's like, from what we've found, it was fairly commonplace for humans to feed on these large tortoises. And uh, it was almost, com it was complete and total extinction of, of most of them. And they've survived tens of millions of years of more extreme climatic shifts. Not to say that something didn't happen this time that would have dealt, dealt some blow that a different shift didn't, but uh, you throw humans into the mix and suddenly all of them disappear. And, and we keep finding older and older human remains. Some of them go back as far as 15,000 years. And uh, it, it's just difficult to, it's difficult to draw any conclusions based on, because all we have is the fossils we're finding. We don't have anything that wasn't fossilized or hasn't been uncovered yet. And, uh, and then it's, it's, it's really a case-by-case -case basis, because what you mentioned with the, gulf, the bolster tortoises, I don't, it, it wouldn't surprise me if they're just extinct there because of the climate change. Like, if the deserts, it's already, like, a, they can't, it's already kind of a fragile habitat. It's not like some of the habitats on the East Coast, which if there's a temperature shift, it's more adaptable, like there's still the resources and everything, but if the temperature increases in a desert, well, that's going to cause some serious issues because there's already the resources already stretched thin. They're already eking out a tougher existence. So, if the habitat, if the temperature increases any more, they could pretty easily knock them off. But. In desert, the desert's interesting because there, there are some. I I sort of take the climate models and projections from past events. I mean, we're talking thousands of years ago, and we're trying to interpolate data. To kind of build back to that I, I take a lot of that with a grain of salt and, and try to look at the models that are used I, I think with just the climate change debate in general uh, a lot of the debate has become politicized and when stuff becomes politicized you kind of lose track of the science it's sort of we should really be looking at how well these the models that project these things work uh, so but I think when you look at the it's sort of the same thing we're projecting climate in the future whereas we're projecting it in the past uh, but I, the, the models that exist for that region of the world in the in the the, 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 the southwestern deserts they do project that 8,000 years ago it was more there was kind of more forest it was a little bit less it was kind of like a mixed forest with sort of a xeric ecosystem so it hasn't changed a ton but that is sort of retreated to higher elevations, whereas lower elevations were more forested. And I, but a tortoise certainly could adapt to that. But to what extent? I, I'm not really thinking. I'm not really saying. My mind is set on anything. If it was humans or what, what, what really drove this out? Because to what extent would it? Like you said, it, it's sort of, it's strange that around the time that humans sort of proliferated around. In, in this area that we saw these massive reductions but at the same time too we have to get a better grip on the fossil record because when you talk even the Hespera testudo uh, the dates that we have for a lot of those species are they're thousands of years apart for extinction now granted that's that could just be due to the fact that we have we have a lot of material but at the same time our dating methods have a high kind of standard deviation error and uh, but it does seem like there was some sort of staggering and, and to map that kind of staggering with the projected extinction distributions would be interesting with where populations were because then you could really get an idea and that that's something t probably pretty doable to figure out where human centers were and then mapping tortoise extinctions on that but that's sort of a computerized that that would be some sort of statistical analysis but it would be interesting to do. oh oh but, I mean, it, the one thing we can deduce is 
the humans certainly did eat a lot of tortoises and even large tortoises. How how big is the one in the in the Florida Museum? I think it's in. Is it in Florida? Or it was at one point where it's got the spear through the <laughs> the carapace. Florida. Uh, the, uh, carapace the carapace was like, was like 40 or 50, 50 inches. inches. Like, it was giant. giant. And yeah. the, the mainland the tortoises, tortoises uh, uh, they were different, different like, like, physiologically different than, different than most of the insular tortoises, tortoises you see. They have much yeah, thicker much and denser, denser shells. shells. Like, modern like Galapagos, Galapagos tortoises, tortoises have much thinner shells, shells than Hespero testudo. Probably has to do more with the great amount of predators that existed at the time. In the late Pleistocene, there still existed a lot of much more dangerous predators than exist today. You had... Uh, uh, most of the megafauna mammals, mammals but, but they had to protect they had to need, need some form of protection against that, that. and, uh, and uh, but I also wonder yeah, too to yeah. what extent early because we're I mean we're talking again thousands of years ago rather than hundreds of years ago and a lot of communities that sort of evolved to coexist with nature sort of had these kind of built in uh, systems to to not destroy things to the point where it wasn't because if you had large tortoises like that that were an easy resource there'd be no real uh advantage to just using them all up i mean it's not that and and if someone were to hunt them to the point where some other effect kind of slowly led to their downfall you've got two different things going on then then you could lead to that but to what extent hunting i mean it, it's really kind of speculative if if people were that it kind of had that kind of foresight that long ago, but it, it, you see that with a lot of indigenous cultures even now. They're not really going to drive something to extinction. They kind of do it in, in harmony because they realize that at a certain effect, you can eliminate an easy Thanks. resource. I don't think there was much thought there any of it. I don't think there was any kind of systematic approach to it. Like, it's it's not something you can really compare to what was done to the masquerade tortoises. That was like the tortoise equivalent of like the Holocaust or something like that. I know that's it's not the best thing to compare that to human atrocities, but uh, for I mean they they're all dead. That was millions of them, and we like killed them all within a couple hundred years. And uh, it was a systematic like effort with no real care to what happens to the tortoise population as a whole. It was a short-sighted, we, we take as many of them as we can. We need the food, we need their fat to make oil, we need their oils, we need all of that. No care in the world for what for the long-term effects of taking hundreds of tortoises at a time. And, uh, but it's, it's difficult to, to tell what it was, what the human tortoise interactions were like thousands of years ago. And uh, if they had a major effect, it was probably more gradual. It probably wasn't, they probably weren't going out there and killing every single one they could find, but even just killing a few large adults would probably have a negative impact on the population. Like that's how most really large uh, colonians are. Once they're, they take a long time to mature, they don't reproduce super fast. And uh, like you see with alligator snapping turtles, it's really easy to deplete them. Like, yes, you, you have to do some intense trapping, but even taking a few adults out of the stream will have a negative impact on the population. So, and yeah, that's it, it true. Even, even like not too out of the field to reason, like that, like the Clovis and like the early like North American colonizers would have like hunted some of those tortoise species because I know that they found like a box turtle and like common snapping turtle and like a a lot of like I guess smaller like mammalian and like reptile like remains at like some of the sites or whatever. So I mean I think it's a lot, a lot like a lot less uh, I guess drastic of a or I guess reasoning or claim or just to think that like tortoises would be probably like on higher up on like the menu than like some of the sort of larger like mega fauna. Like I think it's there's a lot more just I guess basic like reasoning to think that tortoises would you know have and, and that happens, that happens really anytime a population of tortoises and most of what we've seen recently has been the insular tortoises so that's it's almost un, it's pretty much you can't deny that humans are, are more largely responsible for the extinction and population reductions of most of them from like a all the masquerine tortoises are all extinct most of the seychelles tortoises are extinct uh the madagascar giant tortoises are extinct and uh I mean, the there were giant tortoises in the in the Canary Islands, but it's not as like some try to argue that those were hunted to extinction by humans, but there's no conclusive evidence, and they may have went extinct before humans ever went to those islands. And they were actually uh, they were centricellies, those volcanica, 
but chard eye there was a few other species but they were uh endemic to like the, the, the three or four islands in the like in the canaries group but they may want extinct to volcanic eruptions and, and changes in the habitat long before humans ever made it to those islands so this might be a question for Jack, but uh, do you know if there's like any like good books um, on like Pleistocene era, like reptiles and stuff? I've read a few on like mammals, but I haven't really gone around to looking for like related like animals and stuff. I actually just got a book when I was in Florida. It's uh, we got it from the Florida Museum itself. It's it's like the history of fossils in Florida. Yeah, I mean, like, I've, the first few chapters are really in-depth, just, like, bone, like, anatomy of just how, like, everything about osteology is essentially how it starts. But it gets to stuff later, and it won't really, it doesn't present a lot of arguments and things as to why some of the animals are extinct. But what it does is it lays everything out for you, all the data that's there, most of the fossils that are collected, and what's common in, in, in Florida. And, uh, I mean, there's some books out there that are less informational, and they're more... There's this one called The End of the Megaphone. It's a decent book, but it's, it's really just the pictures. Like, it, it doesn't have a ton of information. It just depicts ecosystems uh, and with, like, the arrival of prehistoric humans. And it's, it's a lot of that's from the old world, which if we think it's difficult to determine the effect of humans here, you go to, the, you go to Africa and, uh, like, the western parts of Asia where not even, like, Homo sapiens, but older hominids have been spreading out of Africa for hundreds of thousands of years. They've had, it's even more difficult to determine the impacts they've had, but uh, there's that, and there is one article the IUCN published, I mentioned it earlier, where it's, a, it's like a checklist of all the species of turtles and tortoises that have went extinct in the late Pleistocene till recently, and uh, now it doesn't, it's not explicitly saying, it's not trying to make a conclusion that, well, all of them were hunted to extinction by humans, but uh it just lays all the data out on the table. Like there's some pseudemies in there and trachemies that uh, pro apparently lay, they were they went extinct in like the early Pleistocene. Like they probably just died from died out from some environmental change or who knows. But then you get to some of them and it's pretty undisputable. It's like well then they have uh, they have like uh, what's the word called? I'm, I'm forgetting it right now. Like a pit. What's like a pit where all the tra all of the weight human waste and stuff is thrown into? You know what I'm talking about, Michael? Like There's a, a name. Midden? Yeah, yeah. Midden. Yeah. They find uh, like middens from the past couple thousand years on uh, New, uh, New Caledonia and uh, the islands of Fiji and the South Pacific, and that's where they find uh, they find remains of myelinids from there, with that have been cut and they're charred. And these aren't that old. They're they're um, the most recent myelinid remains are something like 1500 BC. Like uh, they almost made it to the modern. To the modern age and they're older than they're an older lineage than the rest of the world's turtles so that's probably the biggest uh i don't know biggest shame that those no longer exist and i mean they were they were fairly diverse in uh mainland australia and uh, all the south pacific islands but i mean every time the new caledonian ones might have made it into the ad right i mean that was hypothesized i think i could they weren't they weren't I mean, they were still large. Like, no myelinids were small. They were all massive. But, uh, would you guys know what myelinids are to begin with? I don't know if I, I know you do, Michael, but. Horn turtle. Uh, no, I'm saying that one of the species they think could have been, like, almost less than a thousand years ago that it was extinct. I'm not sure if it was even named, but it was on New Caledonia. Yeah, yeah. Myelania, I think, Demolify or something. Like, it was a smaller species. It wasn't their their whole their total length was like four feet probably. But you got to keep in mind they have a huge tail and it's heavily ossified, like kind of convergent with uh, uh, glyptodons and ankylosaurs. Like they had that similar body plan. And uh, I mean, it was still a large a large turtle, probably about the size of a small Aldabrotortus or something. But the ones from mainland they were gargantuan. There was ones that had skulls that were over two feet wide. And their they had then they, their shells were something like six seven feet long. For people unfamiliar with them, I think the most interesting feature is the horns, the large horns that project from the skull. I mean, that's something that would be so interesting to see a living a living tortoise with that uh, configuration. They're also kind of outside of your traditional 
classification of player dyers and crypto dyers too, which is pretty interesting. Well, theoretically, no, no one really. It's tough There's to say exactly that. where extinct tortoises fall on that continuum. We can't even make up our minds about where turtles and tortoises fall on on the reptile continuum. So, yeah. so, so. it's it's. it's like Generally, generally, it's kind of well accepted that uh, myelinids predate, or at least predate the the, the plerodire cryptodire split, but they can't really say for certain. And I don't think they have. I don't think we can ever get any look into their genome because I mean they've been extinct for thousands of years. So that's gonna that's something we don't really have. It's relying mostly on their skull morphology because that's the what preserves best. Uh, they do the the New Caledonian myelinids are the only ones we have full skeletons of because they're so recent. Like. They'll, They'll it, it, if you're, if you find the right find middens, the right you can find full skeletons of them, which is crazy. And, uh, they're such a prehistoric, wild looking animal. You never would have thought that, uh, they almost made it to the modern age, just, just off by a couple thousand years. And, uh, they, and in some islands, like on some of the islands near Fiji, they actually coexisted with tortoises, true tortoises, uh, like Testudinidae, not other myelinids, but it was thought tortoises had always been absent from that region of the world, but. Uh, they, found they found both of their bones at the bones same, in the same midden, they found, found testudine bones and, uh, myelinids, which is interesting, interesting. But, but both, both of them both had been killed by, probably, probably by the same, same group of people. people. Yeah, it's interesting. I, when you say about the genetics, I mean, it's, it would be interesting to, to see that all the remains that they have and with that tissue, at least preserved, it would be tough, but there could be ways to. They've extracted usable genetic material from mostly frozen animals, which obviously that's a different deal. But there could be a way to maybe look for something. I'm not really sure how that would go, they'd go about that. But if you had some sort of bone or something and it was deep, oh, deep oh, reserved, uh, yeah. If it's fossilized, you're kind of done. But yeah, I, I don't. That's yeah, the don't. case with most of it at this point. Oh, uh, that's unfortunate. I wish. Like, it, I wish it, go on. Go well, just seeing where those tortoises would kind of exist in an island environment is pretty interesting. And just to think that we uh, were quick to remove them from the environment before we could even get illustrations or anything. It's just sort of, uh, uh, it's, uh, another, another group of animals, of another majestic group of reptiles that was also the last survivors were on New Caledonia that also were wiped out around the same time as the myelinids were uh, the Mikosukids, which uh, were terrestrial crocodiles. They were crocodilians adapted to be terrestrial predators. They walked with the, their limbs beneath their bodies. They had, they had uh, reduced tails and they had uh, almost much, almost more of a kind of deeper, more canine-like skull. They were designed to be predators on land. And the, the ones in uh, some of the mainland species that went extinct 50,000 years ago or whatever, they were huge. They, were, they could have been as large as 20 feet long. But uh, the, the last species that in, in known from the fossil record was present on New Caledonia. They reach about three feet in length, but they could have even been arboreal. There's, there's, there's hypotheses that they were an arboreal species, which is crazy to think a small crocodile that is arboreal. But, I mean, New Caledonia was an insane place back then. There was also flightless birds, and they still have the world's largest geckos and things like that. So it's, it's a crazy island. And the, the vegetation there is like reminiscent of the Cretaceous. It's all ancient ferns and plants that have been isolated for millions of years. There's an interesting book about a biologist who did work there, the contemporary, but it's still pretty interesting. I haven't actually read it, but it's called, um, actually, I don't remember what it's called. It's uh, Islands and the Sea. I'll grab it right now. I'll show you guys because this was one. Well, this was one at the Society for the Study of Amphibian and Reptile meeting in uh, 2018. They were giving this one out to everybody because it was new, and then they continued to do it 2019. So maybe they'll do it in 2022 because we've got a new cohort of uh, founders fellows. Uh, so kind of interesting. But they they gave this book out. Uh, I'll. It's kind of a cool. I think it's. Oh no. Okay. Well. I'm, I'm, right, I'm now, right now trying to pull up the, the that article the, I was talking about. about. It's uh it's six. It's about seventy it's about pages. 70 it's, pages. Just, it's just it, it has world maps, maps and uh di like diagrams, diagrams of everything and, and a list of all the, of all the 
colonians is one extinct prior to modern era, which they consider the modern era uh, starting at 1500 AD. So, let me... Well, okay, I was mistaken about islands in the sea, and I think I was getting two things uh, mixed up here, because there, there was one of the students at the SSR in 2019 in Utah that was into uh, Lichianus geckos from New Caledonia. And have one, have one. Yeah, so he was into that, and we were talking about this. These are from this is a book about the West Indies, so that's uh, essentially that's the Caribbean. So I was mistaken there, but uh, it's did you just say cool. you have yeah. Lichianus, Jack? Jack? What? What? Did you just say like you have a Lichian? Yeah, and so the way that it's like a, there's an interesting trade with them. There's all these breeders that breed them, they try to keep them as quote unquote pure as they can from the different localities. You, you just can't know them because it's you're buying them from a like breeder, like a breeder. You, you can't expect okay, this is this one comes from this exact islet. It might show the traits of ones from that islet, but you just can't be sure because you who knows how much crossbreeding and stuff they've done. But I did used to have one. He was one of he was one from one of the smaller islets. Not like the Isle of Pines or the main New, Cal uh, New Caledonia main island. It was from a small island. And uh, it sucks because they, they live a very long time. I don't even know why he died. He was really healthy. And uh, I got it when he was a baby. He was small. He was about four inches long. And uh, he actually became larger than my bearded dragon. He was huge. And uh, he didn't eat anything other than... Uh, yeah, that's the article I just emailed you. Look, who, look at everybody who's in there. You got fucking... Scott Thompson, Scott Thompson, Van Dyke, Van Dyke Iverson, Iverson, Rodin, Rodin everybody's, everybody's in, here. in here. Yeah, it's uh, this is definitely a crazy collaboration. Uh, but yeah, this for, for anybody that's yeah. curious in extinct turtles and tortoises, even though it's just a short window of time. It's certainly the most in well, actually, you know, there's more in depth reviews on certain taxa. The one thing about that's interesting about turtle paleontology is that it, it, some of the reviews are incredibly extensive, which is interesting because paleontologists have to work with, uh, you know, they have to work with purely morphological data most of the time. And when you're talking sort of a modern taxonomy, that's not really the, the, the way of the future is not really. And, and, and even now the direction is, is to kind of not rely on that. So as you can imagine, when you just have sort of a one data set that you're comparing to, we can kind of think of morphological data as a single unit of kind of understanding and then compare that with genetics. That's just kind of more informative. Uh, every nucleotide is essentially a piece of information, whereas morphology can kind of mislead us into thinking something's related when it isn't. Um, but when, when you're just working with one type of data, there's a lot of error that you can be prone to. And so it, it, a lot of times, I mean, we're talking 600 to 700 page dissertations or reviews where they will go incredibly in depth into just even skull morphology and they'll look at matrices of hundreds of characters to compare species because you really have to try to get as much coverage as possible i mean when you're doing genetic work you're you're looking into everything within a certain well even genetic work is is kind of uh is limited in terms of what you're looking at but you're looking at sort of the totality of uh, molecular processes and, and protein functions and everything and you can see that when you sequence uh, something's dna but when you're just looking at morphology, you're looking at the expression of a lot of those processes that go unnoticed. So you're prone to a lot of errors. But with this kind of thing, if you can get hundreds of characters, you can be a little more confident that certain species are related if they are and, and that kind of thing. So this is, I would say, certainly one of the most uh, kind of full reviews. But I would actually argue it's kind of pretty concise and compact for the amount of information it includes, you know. Yeah. yeah, and actually, and actually uh, uh, some of the, some of, the, the, some of this, some like, of portions of this, of this uh, publication are actually in a lot of the books of the book that you have, that I have, like, uh, like uh, the turtle, turtle checklist, checklist from the Colonial Research, Research Foundation, Foundation. It, this is, like, it includes a lot of this, and uh, a couple of the other books, too, as well, but another thing I want to say is a lot of the Hespro Testudo is, yes, if you look at the genus, it had a lot of species, 
like a, something like that. I think there was at least 20 species recorded, but then you mean you got to take into account a bunch of different things. But the dates between a lot of the species aren't aren't looked on as much. It's like yes, you have some of them from the, but not very many of them actually did exist at the end of the Pleistocene. Most of the Hesperotestudo fossils are from like 500,000 years ago or before. A lot of them are really old. It's uh, but there but the few species that were. Uh, recorded it recently in the fossil record. They're very prevalent. Like uh, all throughout Florida, like Hesperotestudo, uh, Crassicutata is the species. That's the really common one. Uh, those those are everywhere. Like uh, that's probably one of the most common turtle fossils. You know, you probably have a better shot at finding one of those than like a musk turtle fossil. And uh, yeah, you'll find. I mean, you'll find uh, other ones. And there's there's place to see Hesperotestudo like all the way out into Texas and really along the whole Gulf, Gulf Coast. Yeah, I mean, I'm looking here. This is a map of, the, I don't believe, well, this is when they were assumed to be extinct, but also when they were sort of the per, the periods of time when species were, uh, are assumed to have existed. Uh, so this is not necessarily a metric for extinction because you never know what data you're missing there. Uh, just when you describe the species, if they cluster, I mean, the more information you have, the more available data, you can kind of create a time limit. But a lot of this is just when they were present. And it, it's pretty all over the board. I mean, you have a lot of animals that were in the late Pleistocene that seem to have, that was kind of the, the end of their reign. Uh, Bahamian tortoises, Cubensis, the Kelanoides. Uh, these are probably some more Hespero testudo up in Texas. The, I think, Anne's tortoise and the dwarf tortoise. And then, yeah, probably Crassicutata and, there's another few species, I think. In Pennsylvania, there's actually been Hesperotestudo fossils found all the way up the East Coast, like up into Pennsylvania. And a lot of the Pennsylvanian ones are really old, but uh, I mean, there's a fossil site not far from me in Maryland where they've actually found Hesperotestudo. So they, that genus used to range really far north in the country. So even back, it's always been fairly cold in, in that region of the country. So they've had to have had some way to adapt to it. Like, I don't, a large, a tortoise that size, I don't think they could easily burrow, but it's thought that, it's thought they might have done that in the South, that they might have actually, uh, they might have dug burrows like gopherus, at least some of them could have, but it's not impossible. I mean, sulcatas dig burrows and your biggest sulcatas can be almost 300 pounds. So, I mean, I don't think tortoise, I don't think they're necessarily the size would limit them from digging a burrow. I think it has to do more with other adaptations. I know that this conversation really could really go like on indefinitely, but do we want to maybe like get into the uh, like turtle trivia and start to wrap things up? That sounds. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we've got. I got. Yeah. Well, that. I mean, it's certainly interesting. I think at some point. You know, it's one of the most interesting because we're talking about so many different factors, human impact on the ecosystem, which is really a big, uh, a big thing. And then also climatic effects, which is something in this day and age, it's essentially more pressing by the day. Uh, and to get somebody on here to talk about both sort of the, the tortoise and megafaunal extinctions and their views on that, uh, and all, but also someone who even could come on here and talk about like climate modeling. That would be something interesting is to get someone who's an actual climate scientist uh, that is maybe a little bit less politicized about it. I, I don't really know. I, I mean, I'm not, I don't really know which way. With that kind of thing, it's become such a political debate uh, that it would be interesting to talk to someone who has kind of raw data and, and a viewpoint on it, just to, someone really experienced in that area to hear what they kind of say about the actual models uh just to talk about and to we'll find people for that i think but in the future we can really have a cool discussion with people and, and learn some some other things uh well i i just have one more question for jason because that seemed like it was an interesting class what was the conclusion was it that megafauna were not or, or was it kind of just left open for your interpretation so like, so, like, I think there was like a bit of kind of like left open for like mega fun at large, but specifically looking at like the argument, um, like, I guess that's pretty well believed that like humans hunted mammoths to extinction. Like we can pretty much say that like that like likely did not happen. Um, just 
even like when you like actually look into like the, um, the way that the Clovis like moved across the North American landscape and you look at the logistics of it all and then like you look at you know even like the uh, amount of like sites where um, we've had like a uh, Clovis um, like points and stuff associated with mammoth uh, like, um, sites as compared to like um, a lot of like the deer and like the smaller st stuff um, I think like the general consensus is that like we you know obviously like we can't you know speak with absolute certainty because you know we don't have time machines or stuff but um we well like the clovis specifically and like early like north american colonizers like very likely did not um, bring about the extinction of the mammoth um we definitely have like brought about the extinction of a lot of other stuff but um definitely like probably not the mammoth in fact uh, the um, professor who taught that course dr met and aaron I'm not sure like how far of a stretch it would be to get him on here, but like that would be super interesting to kind of like get um, information about that, like from the source. Since I know he's like done a lot of stuff with like Clovis and uh, like he's done a lot of experimental archaeology. So that might be something down the road to see if we could get him on. I, do have a, I was going to say, I have a question for you. Was that like study just focused completely on like the woolly mammoth like and the human's effect on that or was it more encompassing of most megafaunal mammals or it was just the mammoth um so it wasn't like a specific study we it was like a part of the the, the course or whatever but and we, we were just looking at um, like clovis and specifically like north america like um i know that there were like some uh like gonfa theories or like mammoths and mastodons in like south america and i can't really speak to that but um, I know, like, we're just looking at, um, like, North America. That's kind of, like, what we learned from that course. But it would definitely be cool to see if we could, like, get him on because, obviously, like, he'd have a lot more information be able to speak with more confidence about his uh, knowledge on the topic than I think any of us could. Yeah, he'd probably have some insight. One thing I've always been curious about is, like, the woolly mammoth is the one with the most, the, the, probably one of the most iconic Pleistocene mammals. But... If you think about the, the environmental needs of the woolly mammoth, it wasn't as adaptable as the Colombian mammoth and uh, a lot of the southern ones, which I think if humans were to have had, I mean, this is more of like a speculation here, but if humans were to have more of an impact on anything's extinction, it probably would have been the Colombian mammoth, since the, the woolies might have even been doomed to, to begin with because they were their temperature their habitat was was shrinking it was getting warmer and uh they, they required more specific conditions so and, and like you said there isn't even a whole lot of evidence that the wool that there was extensive hunting against woolly mammoths but there actually is a lot of evidence for hunt extensive hunting against colombian mammoths and uh they were really adaptable not saying i'm not an expert on them but they lived in almost every habitat from like northern like southern mexico all the way up to about halfway through the u.s like the colombian mammoths another one of the most common fossils in like the southeast like that would be something i'd like to find but uh like yeah the, the uf uh their museum has a 14 foot tall skeleton of one but i mean it, it's it's all difficult to tell but and so getting into the trivia here do uh we remember like you um ask the questions or do we have to like respin uh, this oh, we're respinning. Gotcha. Oh, man. Oh, man. Uh, what are our <laughs> questions today? What kind of stuff are we doing? We don't know yet. That's the whole point. Are we able we to use, like, wheel. sources and stuff? Because off rip, I'm not sure. But, like, I do have, like, are we able to sure, reference sure. our books? Yeah, yeah. First you got two minutes, but you can do whatever you want to get the answers. So take that as you will. Let's do that online. Wait, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> It's gonna ask some insanely specific question. Oh god. oh god, this is the most nerve-wracking part. Um, yeah, what's what? What chromosome is? What chromosome is the uh, ND four? No, well, that's I think that yeah, that's mitochondrial. So that's not really. That would have been a. That's a trick question. What chromosome is the site B gene on? Oh, I had to know this for genetics. But that was like last year, so a lot of this, I couldn't tell you. Well, it's a trick question because it's it's mitochondrial DNA, so it's not. It's packed in its own system, sorta. Of. Um, okay, what's the name I'm missing here? We've got Ken, Jason. Okay. 
You gotta ask like some sort of like obscure O chem question. No, no, that, that, no. To turn. You know, it has to be tangentially related to um, turtles in some way, which I guess the the mitochondrial question is. But I think that that's kind of a little bit far off. We can make that judge. Okay, I'm pulling up the name generator. I'm sharing it here. All like, right. Like, so speaking so of, everyone can see of, this. I'm not just. I'm not kidding here. Um, okay. Three, two... So this is the person that gets to pick the questions is first. Okay. Alright, I get to pick the question? You get to, yeah, you get to pick the questions. Oh, I have to remove you. Let's do that. So you get to yeah, pick the uh, questions. What, uh, what... And then... Let's see who I'm questioning. The person that gets to be questioned here, we're gonna see. Uh-oh. <laughs> you were telling me not to oh, burn those questions. Now I gotta say, I gotta tell you that. I feel like I only ask questions that I know something the answer to. I'm not gonna ask something that... Uh, Is that uh, a diss on so, me or something? So. I, well, I mean, if you could ask the question, you'd probably know the answer. All right, All right, so we got two so. minutes. We got someone pull up the Jeopardy music and mute your mics when you're not on. All right, let me All mute right, my. He's got, he's got two minutes. This better not be all specific sizes of animals, and if I'm not like point five centimeters off, I don't get it right. No, that's not at all what I was gonna do. Okay. Because that's kind of a that's like a BS kind of question to ask. Nobody knows well, that I mean, stuff off the top of their head. Somewhat, it would be somewhat valid because at the same rate, like the whole point is we want to try to stump each other. And we're trying to – I guess the point of this is just it's funny and we also teach the audience something maybe. So assuming we're right. Can everyone hear this? How many questions are we doing? <laughs> I don't remember how, Can how we did it. Is the Jeopardy music audible? I can, yeah, I can, I can hear it. it. Okay. Oh, yeah. You got five, I'll do a couple, five, I'll do a You got five questions. Am I still am I still sharing my screen? No, I'm not. I deleted that. I'm good. Look I at might him, he's throw focused. In, I'm throwing one question about size. Yeah, you can. It, the thing I'm is, like, if I don't try. if I don't give you what exactly the the checklist yeah, says, then yeah. give me a little bit of leeway. That's not really I a great great question. Uh, I got one so far. I got to check this out while Jack's working on that. I guess there's these music tracks that are supposed to mimic evolution. Somehow they like transposed evolution in into music or something. I, I'm just trying to, and it's like, it's supposedly so terrible, but it's, it's like artistic. So it counts. I don't know really. Uh, I mean, there's like stuff with like, uh, like making uh, music from like color or something. So I'm sure that, um, there's that like a way to do it, but I don't know. Do you want? Is there like one for turtle evolution or like something relevant to this? I'm trying to. I looked it up and I can't seem to. It's all like evolution of music. And Wait, 
But is the time up? I'm not. I have. I have to write two more questions. Hold up. I didn't really time you, but I would say that we're getting close. I got some good ones. Some aren't. Okay. Some's not too hard. I, I wanted to mix it up. So. Um. Well, I can't find. I gotta look it up. But I was. I was listening to this other, this other podcast where they were. Can you hear me? Is that good? Um, actually, what happens when I do this? Can you hear me? Is it like changing? It got my loud, volume. Got it just yeah. got louder. Is it like? Is it too loud? No. Okay, so I'm good here. Um, it was on this other podcast I was listening to, and they were talking about it. It seems kind of, you know, for something for the sake of art is kind of unfortunate. I think sometimes. Just because you label it as art doesn't mean it's good. Yeah, that can be yeah, said about a lot of like this modern like stuff. It's, <laughs> it's, I don't know, man. When they do the paint splatter stuff, you know that I I can't really stand that. There's a some people just like that stuff, but I feel I mean maybe I shouldn't be talking. Maybe I should get into that kind of thing because if you can pay, get someone to pay fifty k plus for it, then I guess. All right, you're well over two minutes now. You've had about five, so I'm getting four. You... only four. Come on, I, I, to... I had Jason. I had Jason in like a minute. I had all that stuff. I had all that I, stuff I on my mind. All right, try not to include certain things. All right. Yeah. You're, right okay. Well. Right okay. All right. I want to make right further right. entertaining questions, questions, and they actually have decent actually, information, not just, just like just how big is this. Right, that's fair. That's fair. All right. I got one more. I'm trying to think. Maybe you just go with the uh, four that you have, and then like my class to get like three or above. No, just let, let him get one more. I'll let him do it. I uh, I um I one of the things that was fun this week is I got a subscription to Science Magazine. I guess that came. I'm presenting at a a conference uh, on the Ponter uh, work that I did. Uh, and it's associated, it's the age AAAS, triple A S, uh, and they do the science mag thing. And so in science magazine, they sent me like a subscription to it. It's pretty interesting. The way the magazine works is they do articles on everything. And then they also include the research paper on it. So it's like the ultimate kind of way to do that. But okay. He's got his questions for me. So there's definitely, there's definitely some of them, but I do have, Ken, a you better get, Ken, get a drum roll going here. I, I got to have a little bit of hype going. <laughs> Best part. All right. I, I haven't ever asked anyone questions yet, I don't think. All right, so, you ready? Yeah, this is his debut. So. All right. So, the first question, it's not all that hard, but I, I think you'll like it. What was the Latin names of the two tortoise species that were St. Patrick on the Mascarene Island of Rodriguez? Okay. Um, okay, so the saddlebacked was Vosmerai. Yep, that's one. Yeah, that's one. Yeah, that's And the domed tortoise was Peltastes. Yep, you got it. Yep, you got it. All right, I got the first one. Yeah, that one I figured yeah, out. That one I figured All right. Okay, uh, well, that, yeah, that was not too bad, but it's okay. Uh, but this one might be a bit harder. So, on Wolf Volcano in the Galapagos, there's a few different isolated subpopulations. There's a small one that is trapped in the caldera of the volcano itself. How many tortoises are in that subpopulation? 60? 40 to 60? Is Damn. That... You actually got it. Actually got it's it. exactly 40, exactly to 60. 40 to 60. All right. Let's see. Let's I'm see. on fire. All right. All right. What is a major morphological Okay, difference? wait, wait. Before we go to the next one, the, the reason I knew that is because it's in the Galapagos book, and they're, they're isolated on a little ridge, right? It's in the Caldera. Yeah. yeah. Okay, they're isolated. So that, they're yeah. isolated. Yeah, I had a feeling you'd remember that one, but I was... I well, that, that just was... stood out to me, because someone with... Uh, uh, Dr. Offerman, I, Grayson's dad, he went there and was talking about that one, so I, that stood out in my head. All right, so All right. We, got a, we got a couple more. Um, what is the... Let me think. What is the westernmost drainage occupied by... What, what is the western and easternmost drainages occupied by uh, Apalachicola? 
Okay. Official. Well, okay. A documented population. Okay. Of population. Officially. Um, okay. Um, so, confirmed or confirmed? Confirmed. 100%. 100%. Okay. Um, so, Western, easternmost. Give me a second here. I, I'm trying to think of the one. Okay. The Oklahoma Econfina Creek is on that, right? So Econfina is the yeah. westernmost extension, and then the easternmost is it the Oscilla or the no. Wasilla? Yeah, there were bounds. The no, the you the Oklahoma is one of the answers, but uh. uh the Aquaconi is actually farther east than the Apalachicola. It's, it's the eastern extent. The western extent's the one I'm looking for. Oh, oh, uh, the Sepola. No. No. I'm wrong. Okay. It's uh the Chakawatsi. Oh. That's pro. Oh yeah. Well. Okay. Yeah. You're right. Okay. So, Michael, you're at, like, what, three for four then, or was that the I'm fifth at, one? Yeah, I'm at two. Four. Well, okay, wait, was the Oscilla, right. then the, the Wasissa was right, or the Oscilla, there could be in the Wasissa, but the Oscilla is the. They have been, been proven to have breeding populations in there, but they have caught random individuals. I suspect that they're, they're occupying those drainages too, but I just wanted, for the sake of a question, I'm like, which ones are, like, proven to ha have been studied? We know there's a populations in them, so. There is one more question. Okay, yeah. Okay, one, well, okay, I've got two. So if you have five questions, I need to get one more right. But if right. you've got four You're questions, wrong. I'm good. This one's not. So. Okay. All right, so. All right, so. Let's say you compare the skull of uh, Barber's Map Turtle with a uh, Cooper's Creek Turtle. What's one of the biggest differences you're going to notice that's, that's the absent on the Cooper's Creek Turtle, but very prevalent on the Barber's Map Turtle? Zygomatic arch. Yep. You got it. I know that one. Yeah, that that's a good that's a good trivia question. I don't think it, that would be kind of a strange. All right, you've got. Well, okay, I, I'm safe. But if you've got one more, then we can. No, that, that was five. That was, five. Five. That was five. Yeah. That was four, yeah. right? No, that was five. You had like some part like A and B part ones part in there too, so. Okay, I guess the western and the eastern most. So I got – oh, what did I get? Four, okay, yeah, so I'm good. All right, I'm safe. Okay, well, that, you, that was decently tough, but next time you're going to have to go crazy because I'm going crazy. I'm, not, I'm going all out next time, so just be warned. Yeah, I didn't whoever want, gets I didn't it. Want, but whoever I don't want to have – I don't want to, like, ask, like, like six – I don't want to ask five questions that are so that are obscure so that obscure nobody knows the answers to any of them. Answer. Because that would just be awkward for me just sitting here reading questions that no one knows the answer. And I'm sure like, everybody feels the same way. So it's kind of yeah. difficult. You know, I say I say that, and then when I'm like, ah, oh, man, I, I actually want him to get it right. So uh, I, I think you, like, make them hard within reason, and especially, like, I don't know, keep in mind, like, the person you're asking. Like, I know I'd probably get, like, a zero or a one, like, if Jack asked me those. My, uh, well... From my area From of my knowledge, area like you could knowledge. easily ask me questions that this same kind of difficulty, I have no idea what, what I have no clue. Like I just have, these are all some, like things that I would know, like giant tortoises, megacephaly, alligator snapping turtles. That's kind of the stuff. So, huh? so the consensus here was that my question about the current accepted name of the Southwestern long neck was not appropriate. I, I won't do that again. <laughs> <laughs> That was funny. Yeah, I think that was. Yeah, I think that was. Dude, oh man. Oh man. It's yeah, Macrocheladina so. blonda for the record at this point. So. I think another thing to take into account is the viewers. Like we, we got to make sure it's it's un, they 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 still get something out of it. Like. <laughs> it, I mean, yeah, that's actually a good point. Does anyone need to know that? It's sort of the thing. Like if we're just uh, like. All right. I'm, uh, yeah. I wrote them all down on the back. Of a sticky note? Are you still? Are you at your house now? Or are you still watching? You're house watching, right? 
No, right now I'm at my own house. I mean, these are my uh, turtle shells. But uh, and like literally after this call, you're looking big, dude. Have you been Have you been pumping some iron? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you just flexed. Nice. Wait, did Ken just flex? I missed. I missed Ken, it. Ken just leaned back and 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 popped uh and and popped a flex on us. Well, Jack's just a different breed. I mean, you can't tell through the the he, the fact that his nose has been in the camera the whole time is testament to the fact that that how six five right? I think I'm like six I six I'm now. Like six, six, Pretty six, tall. Six six. Jesus. It is nice. Yeah, good. Are you guys?